afternoon, everybody. Um, really, thank you for the invitation. I'm really happy to be here today. I'm gonna, okay, so let me start with a lecture. Although I put myself the title Neutrino, Cuisine, and Beyond the Standard Model, and I put it also in Korean, whatever is written there, I'm not fully responsible. So I'm not gonna cover all the no, neutrino stuff by itself, will take a full week. So I'm gonna cover a little bit of neutrino oscillation physics within the standard model, of course, and what's going on and what is expected. And the model. Baseline experiment. In future, long baseline experiment. I'm written there. I would be okay. I'm visiting here, but I'm staying in France, so August, years, and I will be happy if you drop by chat anytime. Okay. So, as you probably know, something probably most of you know that 10 years ago, in 4th of July of 2012, there is a big major discovery, both collaboration of CERN, ATLAS and CMS announced a five sigma, a little bit below five sigma, to be honest, discovery of a Higgs particle. Now I cannot take control of my own machine. Okay. Of a Higgs particle. <laughs> and this officially opened the race for physics beyond the standard model, although we have been looking for physics beyond the standard model for quite some time. But the same year, exactly a couple of weeks before the sun announcement, there was a big major breakthrough in neutrino physics when the Daya Bay collaboration announced a five sigma evidence of a theta one three, a reactor missing angle different from zero, and not only different from zero, but as large as it could be. And this was a major breakthrough because they opened a different race and they set the start for a different kind of experiments that experience looking for CP violation in the neutrino sector. I'm gonna try to cover why this is important. But before understanding why this discovery is so important, we need to understand what neutrino oscillations are. You know, neutrino mass eigenstates are not identical to interaction eigenstates, and therefore you need to move from one basis to the other mixing matrix. I'm going to work out neutrino oscillation physics in a two by two case with only two flavors. I'm going to extrapolate with three flavors and discuss what's going on with three flavors afterwards. But let's do the two flavor case to understand, to put us all on the same page. As I said, mass eigenstates are not identical to interaction eigenstates. And you can wonder, and it's a fair question, why if I produce neutrinos are mass eigenstates? And I de as interaction eigenstates. And I detect neutrinos as interaction eigenstates. Why should I care at all about mass eigenstates? Why cannot I ignore mass eigenstates altogether? The answer to this is easy. I should care about mass eigenstates because the mass eigenstates are the asymptotic states of the Hamiltonian. These are the only states I know how to propagate. These are the states which evolve with the phase as time goes by. And this is why I need to worry about mass eigenstates. So let's start assuming I produce one neutrino, I call my neutrino my own neutrino, and my new neutrino is this combination of the first and the second mass eigenstate. Now I let my neutrino propagate, and each mass eigenstate will evolve according to a phase which is given by its form momentum and the energy, the distance travel, and the time it took to travel my neutrinos. Now I want to calculate the probability of finding a neutrino different to the one I produced. Okay, so I need to turn back those mass eigenstates into interaction eigenstates and calculate the amplitude. I'm doing this with this matrix, in fact, not with this matrix, with the transpose of this matrix in this way. So I calculate the amplitude, I square the amplitude, I get in the, the probability in this way. So now I'm going to assume, for the sake of my argument, that all neutrinos are produced with the same energy and therefore the momenta differs by powers of the mass square. I could have assumed exactly in the same way that both neutrinos are produced with the same momenta, the same result will come out. I could have assumed that there is a, wet, a Gaussian packet centered around an energy, the same answer will appear, okay? It's just a simplification to do the calculations, but the answer will be always the same. If I do that, you can see that this phase has a term which is common to both terms, and a term at the factor which is unique to this term, a factor which is common to both terms will die. Everything proportional to an identity matrix will die because I'm taking absolute value. So I can remove this factor and I get 
this for the probability of finding a neutrino difference to the one I produce, which is the appearance probability. And with a removing additional phase, this is what I get. This is the famous expression you have seen so many times, where I have introduced this notation, where this delta m is just the difference of the square masses, and this term normally is called the kinematic phase. So far, I have been working in natural units. Natural units means C equal H, which are in fact equal to one. If I want to restore the units, I have to put the Cs and the H in the appropriate places. The exact expression does not matter. The only thing I would like you to pay attention to is that it H comes in the, in the denominator. This means that whenever I'm gonna take the semi-classical limit in two minutes from now, this phase will blow up, okay? And this will be important. So, so far we have calculated the appearance probability, the probability of finding a neutrino different to the one I produce. I could have calculated as well the survival probability or the disappearance probability. The probability of my muon neutrino remain being a muon neutrino. But as I'm working in the two neutrino framework, the probability of my muon neutrino to remain being a muon neutrino is just one minus the probability I have calculated before. And I could have put it just from there. So let's study this probability a little bit, okay? The survival probability, and let's plot this probability as a function of the kinematic phase. Okay, there you are. So the first things you notice is that the amplitude of the oscillation is given by nature. So the probability, so the potential, let's say, the potential to see or not see oscillations is not for you to choose. It's already given by nature. If nature has chosen this angle to be initially small, no matter how smart you are, you won't be able to see oscillations. But once nature has chosen, has given you the opportunity to see oscillations, how cleverly you, des you design your experiment is essential to see or not see oscillations. So the kinematic phase only matters if nature has been generous enough with you before. Okay, so you can see that if this kinematic phase is miserably small, oscillations have, do not have time to develop, and I see a survival probability essentially one. If this kinematic phase is, say, between I don't know, one third and three, I see a beautiful oscillation pattern, and I can see oscillations. If the kinematic phase is way, 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 way larger than three, then oscillations are too fast to get resolved. They smear out to one half, and we say that neutrinos propagate as a relatively incoherent mass eigenstates, which essentially means the interference pattern is lost. You don't see any oscillations. You see a flavor transition, but no more oscillations. Okay, so we start talking about probabilities and not amplitudes any longer. Okay, the interference pattern is lost. This is exactly what happens in the semi-classical limit. In the semi-classical limit, any interference pattern should disappear. And by the way, this is what happened in the case of quarks. In the case of quarks, we all know that mass eigenstates are not identical to interaction eigenstates. We have the CKM matrix. However, nobody ever talks about quark oscillations. We always talk about flavor transitions. Why? Not because the mixing angles are small, but just because the kinematic phase is huge. It's impossible to design an experiment where this kinematic phase is order one, and you can see quarks oscillations. So the physics in the neutrino sector is exactly the same one in the quark sector, but in a more, in a more generous regime, if you want. The other, the other thing I wanted to notice is that given designing an experiment, the fact that the baseline the neutrinos travel or the energy the neutrinos have is not important. The thing that matters is the ratio L over E. So when analyzing a neutrino experiment, you shouldn't care about the precise baseline or the precise energy, but the ratio of L over E. And if you look carefully enough at the ratio of L over E, and if you are seeing oscillations, you immediately find out where is the mass difference involved, because the kinematic phase should be one. So analyzing the experiment, if you are given a baseline and an energy, you immediately know which are the mass difference involved if you want to see an oscillation pattern again. However, this is a game. We know that in nature, we don't have two neutrinos. We have three. And therefore, the, the probability gets this form and the mixing matrix 
has three angles and one face is neutrinos are black, two additional faces is neutrinos are majoran. Where are these numbers coming from? You know that if I have three families, the unitary mixing matrix, the unitary matrix connecting the mass eigenstates to the flavors eigenstate has nine parameters and n times n matrix has n square parameters. But not of this, out of these nine parameters, three are angles and not six and faces, excuse me, three angles and six faces. However, not all these faces are physical. So you can redefine your fields to remove away all the unphysical faces. If your field is your neutrinos react, you can redefine independently left and right handed fields. So in principle, you have six faces to absorb. However, one face is lepton number, it's a global face. You cannot mess up with this face. So you can reabsorb five faces and you are left with only one face, which is called the Dirac phase. If your neutrinos are majoranas, you have half of the degrees of freedom. So you have three, three fields to reabsorb faces, but you shouldn't care any longer about the electron phase. So you have two additional phases, which are called majorana phases. We normally parameterize this matrix in this form, while these two here are the majorana phases, and they are going to appear only in those processes where my neutrino is forced to show its majorana character, and therefore, it's, they are not related to oscillations. This is the, the angle I talked to you about, the, shock, the angle measured by the Gaia Bay collaboration, okay, the last one to be measured. And this angle is normally called the atmospheric mixing angle for historical reason. This angle is called the solar mixing angle for the same reason, because they were born to life due to the anomalies in the atmospheric and the neutrino related sectors. If I have three neutrinos, I have two mass differences, and this is essentially what I have. Two mass differences, one related to the atmospheric mass difference, one related to the solar mass difference. This is the standard notation in neutrino physics where each box represents a mass eigenstate and the color pattern inside is the color distribution inside these mass eigenstates. And they have two mass differences, so there are two orderings. The solar, the atmospheric mass difference on top of the solar mass difference or the other way around, and they go under the name of normal and inverted hierarchy. And essentially, they mean that the farthest away state, the state with the smallest electron neutrino content, can be the heaviest or the lightest. Okay, we have been doing neutrino experiments for, for essentially more than 50 years, so we know a great deal of neutrino parameters. Amazingly enough, the extraction of neutrino values from experiment is not done by experimentalists, but by theorists. Because you have to combine all the experiments together, and you know that experimental collaborations never handle experiments from other collaborations. So this is done by theorists. There are three groups, two groups, doing neutrino feeds. I'm lucky enough, one is in Valencia, and I'm using only the results. The results are in this web page. And in this Q code, okay, this is very Korean, if you ask me. With the Q code, right? this. So these are the one and two and three sigma region of each of these parameters. And you can already see here, although I haven't even written there, that the blue line corresponds to normal hierarchy and the purple line corresponds to the inverted hierarchy. So you already can see that normal hierarchy is favored, although it's not significant at this point here. Okay, so you have the region. So this is only with, uh, in, in, in terms, uh, with the oscillation. Oh, and way. now I'm going to show with data in ball and how. And here I'm putting what the new generation of experiments will do for each parameter. So you see it's a precision game. The amazing thing here, if you look, is that the, the theta one three, the last angle to be measured, is the most precisely measured now. And this is the angle I know anything about. I will say a big deal, although I know that the P2K experiment claim they have found evidence, I think they are stretching the results a little bit. Now, Stefano's question was, this is the data involved. This is the main contribution to each of these parameters, and this is the secondary contribution to these parameters, but you fit all of them together. Okay, so you fit all of them together to extract the number. So what is the physical observable that allows you to distinguish between normal and uh, uh, inverse reality? Okay, Why the fit is matter effects. Different? Matter effect distinguish between the two. Matter effect comes from, from I, I'm going to tell a little bit more about matter effect later, but matter effect distinguish between the two because they are sensitive to the interference between 
longer term and the original term. Exactly in the same way, if you think about market effects, remember one thing, which is we know that the K long is heavier than the K short. We all know that we were born to this knowledge. This knowledge is knowledge of the 70s, okay? <laughs> so how we know that? We made cows pass through a regenerator to interact. And we made an interference between the unknown sign of the okay, long case short mass difference with the known sign of the regeneration amplitude. And seeing whether the interference is constructive or destructive, we found out the difference of the sign. Matter effects are exactly in the same way. I, I, I check this angle against the interaction with electrons in matter. And by seeing whether the signal gets enhanced or reduced, whether the interference is constructive or destructive, I find out the difference. It's exactly the same, the relative sign. Okay, Liliana, did you have a Yeah, I was just wondering if you could explain the behavior of the uh, sign theta 2, 3, because it has like uh, two minima. And, uh, so in the Oh, okay, theta 2, 3. Yeah. Because theta 2, 3 is around maximal mixing, around pi over 4. And remember that I'm measuring, if I if I write in the blackboard, do you see at home? Yes, do you see at home? I see at home. So remember the oscillation forming the sine square of 2 theta. Remember? Okay, just the, the oscillation probability went in this way. But you know that sine of 2 theta is 2 sine theta cosine theta. Okay? So this means that if your angle is a little bit, it's, it's exchanging sine and cosine. This angle and this angle will have exactly the same, the reflections around pi over 4. You see? This is what's going on there. Okay? It's, as I have matter effects, I break this degeneracy, but I don't break it completely. But this comes here. That this angle is very close to pi over four, yeah. and therefore this a little bit above has a degenerate parameter a little bit before because it's just exchanging sine and cosine. Okay, okay. So there, there is a degeneracy. There is a degeneracy look, because I'm measuring mm -hmm. sine of two theta. And sine of two theta is two times theta cosine theta, and reflecting over pi over four is just exchanging sine and cosine. But yeah. in spite of that, there is one minimum. The minimum that is yeah, because of minimum. matter effects, this is broken. The degeneracy. Matter. matter effects. I'm going to talk about matter effects later, but matter effects break the degeneracy. People, you can interrupt me as much as you want, but then time does not count. Okay. <laughs> I don't care, you know, I'm staying here at the end of August. So, <laughs> so you might so, then you stop me. Yeah, this class one hour before. So, so we will let me switch off the lights. This is yeah, here. Sorry. Yeah. No. 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 How do you do that? How do you do that? Okay, I'm sorry. So these are uh, what I'm showing you so far is that experiments that fit, but we also have experiments which do not fit. At least do not fit with the three vanilla oscillations we have seen. I'm gonna name, I'm gonna state first what are the anomalies we have, and then gonna analyze them one by one. The first, and I'm not doing this in chronological order. Now that I come to think about that, I'm doing in opposite chronological order. So let me start with the reactor anomaly. The reactor anomaly was born in 2011. Huber and Mueller independently recalculated the amount of neutrinos I expect to measure from a reactor. Reactor experiments, all of them except Kamlan, are very, are, you put your detector very close to the reactor, less than a kilometer from your reactor. This means you don't have a near detector. In order to calculate the, the to count the neutrinos you observe, you need to calculate the flux you expect from the reactor. So they rely on calculation from the reactor, the you expect from the reactor. Kamlan is a different story because it has in the world. But this was before that. So, Schumer and Mueller came with a calculation in 2011 independently, as I said, and they say that the flux has been un overestimated. So the flux was overestimated and you should be seeing way more neutrinos that you are actually seeing. So you were sitting in the red line for 30 years in seeing that nothing was happening, the survival probability was one, and you were happily measuring one. This was the estimation for the reactor. This is, yes. No, this is what you measure compared. This is observed or expected. 
Yes, so, expected that means that you know what is coming from the reactor. You, with some flux. With some flux, some theoretician had calculated for you. And this is what changed? No. This is changed. This changed the theoretical prediction of the number of neutrinos. This is fire information of the of the reactor. I'm the... gonna discuss this a little bit more. Yes. Okay. This you need to have an honest account of the fuel that is used, the fuel exactly. composition so. at any time on the life of the reactor. But they were, but it, it was, I mean, there is a, a little bit of trust there involved because fuel companies are not transparent and honest, but you can do something like that. In any case, Hubert Mueller said that you are not in the red line, you are in the blue line because the flux has been underestimated, overestimated, excuse me, and you are missing 5% of the signal. The second anomaly is the mother of all the anomalies, if you ask, is the LSND experiment at Los Alamos. LSND was late 90s, it was a first appearance experiments. Now everybody does appearance experiments. At that time, it was the first appearance experiments. They have a small amount of electron neutrinos in a mu neutrino beam. This experiment was very controversial, and I'm going to talk about more about this later. The third experiment is the underdog of all the experiments, are the gallium experiments. These are the oldest experiments of all. And for you to get your idea, Galex is an experiment in Gran Sasso, mainly Italian French experiment. SAGE stands for Soviet American Gallium Experiment. So if it's just Soviet, you know how it is. Okay? So this experiment is a very challenging experiment because it measures neutrinos from the sun. But with gallium experiments, the, order, the energies of the neutrinos is one order of magnitude smaller than the less energetic neutrinos at super k for example they have the lowest threshold of all neutrino experiments and it measures pp neutrinos so they have neutrinos who oscillate and neutrinos who don't oscillate because they have a full or one order of magnitude energy neutrinos so it's a very challenging experiment if you discount that neutrinos from the sun do oscillate they still miss 15 percent of their signal but as i said this was a very hard experiment. Nobody took this into account and this not seriously. This is why I'm saying this is the underdog of all the anomalies. But these three anomalies and all the anomalies that came through these anomalies have something in common. They, if you want to explain these three with oscillations, although the mixing angles are slightly different, the mass difference you need is on the same ballpark, of the ballpark of the electron volt square mass differences, okay? But we know that with three neutrinos, you have only two mass differences. And the highest of the mass difference I showed you before is 10 to the minus three electron volt square. So there is no way I'm gonna have the mass difference with the three neutrinos I already have of one electron volt state. And therefore, if I want to explain this with oscillations, I need extra states. But I have measured the invisible width of the Z boson in the lab experiment at Sun in the 90s. So I know that there are three neutrinos that couple to the Z boson. So if I want to include more neutrinos into the game, I put masses are smaller than the mass of the C over two, I better make sure that these new neutrinos do not couple to the Z boson. And this is why they are called stray neutrinos. What about the synthesis also? Not if they are not fully thermalized. Oh. They need to be fully thermalized to spoil the idea. Okay, so there are ways to include that if you don't populate them much, but still, there are ways to get away with VBN. VBN is not a constraint. There are 100,000 other constraints, but VBN, if you don't thermal, if they are not fully thermalized, VBN is not a problem because these states are not populated. Okay, okay, so let's visit all these anomalies one by one. Let's start with the reactor anomaly. I showed you before, this is Huber and Mueller. I told you they calculated this ratio and found that this ratio was 2.3 sigma away from, from one, from what you expect. Okay, what I didn't tell you is that there are two ways to calculate the flux you expect from a reactor. The first one is conversion, and the other one is summation. Conversion is, look at the spectra of the fuel, this means the sources of your neutrinos, uranium-235, uranium-238, plutonium-239, plutonium-241, and convert this spectra directly into a neutrino spectra. The other one is summation, is calculate by hand all the beta branches, over 1,000, and sum them up. So you, of course, it's easy, it's immediate 
to the eye that although the conversion method is not easy, the summation method is way, way more difficult and more prone to error. Okay, so when a, a calculation appeared by STM Group et al. in 2019 by the conversion method showing that they, they find a ratio of observed versus expected close to one, saying that the significance of the anomaly went to 1.2, again, no anomaly, nobody took this seriously because, you know, the, the calculation is very difficult, and these people may have made a mistake. On top of that, of the same year, 2019, Hayes et al., another group, independently calculate the ratio using the summation method, and they not only agree with Huber and Mueller, but the, the error bars were the same, the error bars are always the same, but the central value went down, so the significance of the anomaly came, went from two point to almost three sigma. The, the situation changed radically because there were already rumors about the uranium-235 when was, the spectrum was badly extracted and was not, and so the situation changed something like, I think a year and a half ago, where Copetti et al. made the calculation, putting you know, the, the central value essentially in one, getting rid of the anomaly. The anomaly was pronounced officially dead in neutrino 22 this year in Scorpio, not in Seoul, in Korea. It was online, so really, I don't know where it was. Okay, but let's assume it was in Korea. So this anomaly is officially dead. There is no more reactor anomaly. There is nothing going on there. So what happened? Happened? there are so many calculations. So for, for what, which reason now people, everybody? Because there was a problem that was shown that if you, if you move the uranium, okay, you have to rely on two things, cross sections in nuclear mm -hmm. physics, which are very complicated. And on top of that, you, you know, the fuel they give you and how you convert, it's, it's a kind of an art to convert the spectra into a flux of neutrinos. And it's not, I mean, the, the summation method is unique. There is one way. This is more complicated than that. And there was a lot of, of debate over the cross sections and how to handle them. I think the, the main problem was uranium 235. So you mean that the calculation, the previous calculation that showed an, an excess uh, had a clear fault, uh, the clear mistake or something that. So, okay, no, I think what is the reason yeah. why everybody now trusts uh, the last calculation and say, okay, all the, no, 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 no. the because the, the original people agree that ah, the original people, people. Yes, okay. yes, yes. No, no. I think everybody agrees with that. Uh, even the previous authors that agree. That the uranium 235 had a problem. They are having proof to show that. Okay, so let me go back to the LSMD. The LSMD was a very controversial experiment, among other things, because the collaboration split due to the result. The, not everybody in the collaboration stand behind the result. The collaboration just split. There was a mess, not what they agreed. So Sarmila decided to set up an experiment, which is the minimum experiment to completely sort out the LSMD problem. The LSMD was an experiment with a very short baseline, 42 meters, 30 MeVs in energy. Mini boon is half a kilometer, half a GeV in energy. So you can see it's completely different, but the yellow area of course, the experiment is exactly the same. So if mini boon finds a signal consistent with LSD, it has to do oscillations. It cannot be anything else. I have a question. If you have two experiments that have E over L the same, but one has much, much bigger E and L than the other, which one is it you expect to have more systematics, uh, more, I mean, and these experiments, I, I mean, it depends how you are getting your neutrinos, if they are getting from an accelerator or you are getting the neutrinos from the atmosphere, for example. The baseline that. itself doesn't matter. The baseline itself is not an issue because neutrinos are not interacting. The cross section is 10 to the minus 38. So it's not that I'm missing anything on the way. Besides, I'm, as I'm going to tell you, long baseline experiments have near detectors on their own. Okay. So the systematic cancels out. So I don't have problems. Okay, so Minimum run for quite some time. And amazingly enough, Minimum has a problem, a mess on it in its own. Okay, Minimum was only marginally consistent to LSMD. And when I'm saying it's marginally consistent to LSMD, I say it was not able to confirm LSMD. And marginally consistent means math is very generous. Okay, and math is very generous. This means you always have a minimum. What do I do? Minimize the function, you always have a minimum chi square. 
okay, do the learning in English life. However, the reason where both experiments are consistent is already ruled out by Opera and Italy. So they are consistent, yes. They are consistent in a region where no, it's impossible, yes. Okay, besides that, mini moon is not internally consistent. This means mini moon signal is not consistent with mini moon antineutrino signal. With the antineutrinos, and in the, in the neutrino signal, they have a fifth, a five sigma excess in its own. It's true that this excess is at the edge, at the edge of its systematics. So what do they do? They sort of they set up another experiment, which is called microwave, which supposedly is part of the Fermi Lang short baseline neutrino program. Fermi Lang short baseline neutrino program has three detectors, 400, 600, and 1.2 kilometers. Microwave is one of these detectors, and it supposedly will be able to solve completely out for good this problem. The bad news is it was shown that there is a small corner of parameter space where micro boom which won't be able to sort out the minimum signal. So it may happen, it may happen that in five years from now we will be exactly where we are now. So if in this small region in parameter space, and this is like so now let's go to the gallium anomaly. As I said, you nobody ever pay attention to the gallium anomaly till there was a new experiment called the best experiment by Pal, the experiment of stray neutrinos, where they measure again these neutrinos. This experiment was done two years ago, was finished two years ago. So through the new technology, the error guard went significantly smaller, but the central value remained the same. The significance went now to the five sigma level. And this is the hosted, hottest anomaly we have so far, which is quite surprising because so far nobody pay attention to this anomaly. So the green, the last two points in green are the best. They are and they, they confirm basically. They, exactly, they say exactly the same these people have been Where saying. Where is it? This is in Baikal, in, the, in Russia. In Baikal, okay. So it, it, in it's Baikal. in the Baikal, in Baikal, in the Baikal yes. lab. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So you are tempted to say, okay, this cross section, but no, don't say that any longer. We used to say, say that, but it's not because it was shown that if you change the cross section, the significance won't change much according to the cross sections we have in the market today. So the, the anomaly is there for good, there, and we need to do that. If you believe in these anomalies, this means we have already discovered physics beyond the standard model. But my claim would be today that even if you do not believe in stellar neutrinos, which I'm going to blame you if you don't, okay? So in neutrino physics, we have discovered physics beyond the standard model long, long, long ago, just by the fact that neutrinos do have mass. So if you think neutrinos are Dirac, you have to introduce new physics to forbid a majority mass term to appear. So you have to impose lepton number. You cannot, you can say lepton number is a global accidental symmetry of the standard model, but we know that global symmetries get broken at high scales. So you have to gauge it somehow or to protect it somehow, and this implies no physics. If you, like me, are like 99% of the community, since the neutrinos are Majorana particles, you have new physics associated to the new scale, and of course you have new phenomena associated with lepton number regulation. So, Neutrinos, one way or the other, imply physics beyond the standard model. Even more than that, neutrino masses, if neutrinos are Majorana particles, can let us pick, and or in the electron flavor violation, can let us pick what's going on at very, very high scales, scales which are, for the time being, not accessible to us directly. And this is why, in order to get a real peak of what's going on and these energies, we aim to have precision on the neutrino parameters. Although there is a disclaimer, my second disclaimer will be here, as I said earlier today, we have a pretty good knowledge of the mass and mixing parameters in the quark sector, and we haven't shed any light on the flavor problem. So it's not guaranteed this is going to happen, but at least it works a trap. So what are the main questions in neutrino physics we want to answer in the next year? Okay, there are four questions. Out of the four questions, three will be explained by the non-baseline problem. 
the one and the most important question won't be addressed by the long baseline question, at least for me, the most important question we have is whether neutrinos are viral or major nanoparticles. This won't be answered by the oscillation experiment. There is no oscillation experiment able to answer that because an oscillation experiment won't be able to distinguish Dirac from Majorana, but there are dedicated experiments from, from that the experiment searching for material stable beta decay and other experiments. Okay, the other three questions will be answered by the long base rate program. They may be answered also for other experiments. They are the first one, of course, if they are additional states, if they are sterile neutrinos. Okay, the shared baseline neutral program will also say something about that, but the long baseline program will do that. The, sec the second one is what's the neutrino hierarchy? It's normal ordering or inverted ordering. For you to understand this or what this means is this is the CKM matrix. The CKM matrix is a very diagonal matrix. We have two possibilities in the neutrino sector. Okay, the normal ordering or inverted ordering when essentially says that the smallest entry is this one or this one. Okay, the, the state with the smallest electron neutrino content is the heaviest or the largest. This is essentially what we say. Okay, and then the holy grail of, of the experimentalist, at least, I'm not saying this is my holy grail because it's not, is whether CP is violated in the electronic sector. Okay, whether this Dirac phase is different from zero. Why is this important? Because you remember that in the 70s, Sakharov calculated or explained the conditions we need a, a, a theory needs to meet in order to generate the baryon asymmetry of the universe. Departure from thermal equilibrium, B violation, and CP violation. The standard model has all the ingredients. However, the phase transition, the electroweak phase transition, is not first order enough, strong first order enough to produce the baryon asymmetry. So the standard model has the potential to do that, but it is unable to do that. Not because the CKM phase is small, it's not. It's just because the phase transition is not first order enough. Okay, so neutrinos can do the job because we have an additional phase transition, the phase transition of Majoranas, and you can generate the asymmetry there. But you are gonna say to me, and this is fair, no, because you cannot generate the value asymmetry. You are gonna generate electron asymmetry, fair enough. I don't care, I generate electron asymmetry there at a very high scale and sit and wait because sphalerons will do the job. Sphalerons will transform any electron asymmetry into baryon asymmetry while I watch, okay? So this will do the job. It's true that even if this phase were zero, I still have two additional Majorana phases. But if this phase were not zero, at least I have a hint I can explain that. So these are the things the experimental program is trying to address. But you know, there was a fantastic phenomenologist, okay? There you are. He's Donald Rumsfeld. Donald Rumsfeld was U.S. Secretary of Defense in the U George W. Bush administration during the World War, the War, the Gulf War, the Second World War. He may not have been a, a very good Secretary of Defense, probably he was not, but he defined what phenomenology is all about. Okay? He said, there are things you know, you know. There are things you know, you don't know. But what is important here is the things you don't know, you don't know. What about the things you don't know, you know? <laughs> this is true. He missed that. This is probably, you know, probably this is why he lost the war. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, so what I show you there, what I showed you before, is the things I know and we don't, we know we don't know. But for a phenomenologist, and if you are not an experimentalist, you couldn't care less about the detector, okay? The important thing, the fun things, are the things you don't know, you don't know, and can blur completely the picture, okay? So these things are the important things to us. And this is what I'm gonna target for the rest of my talk. So let's start with saying how they think they are gonna measure CP violation. In principle, to measure CP violation is straightforward and easy. You look at the appearance probability in the neutrino channel, you subtract the appearance probability of the neutrino channel, and voila, any difference is CP violation. Remember. Sorry, Gab Gabriella, can I ask a question about your last slide? Yes, you can ask. Uh, did, did Micro Boon not rule out uh, sterile neutrinos? Micro Boon not rule out sterile neutrinos. 
not exactly because they always they never will remember that the game here is let me put my glasses so you i see you so no you can never rule out completely rule out there is a parameter a region of parameter space that is excluded i'm going to show you but right so 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 i think mini boon was positive on sterile and neutrinos it, it gave a positive picture and then micro boon came and redid the experiment and then it's sort of at least his paradigm is is less favored now is is that fair to say it's it's kind of fair there is a region of parameter space where micro boon cannot exclude and okay so they are okay let me put it like they are still alive i i think nobody took them seriously before the micro boon result didn't change that so okay, I good. I think they were right. They still think they are right. They jump themselves, I guess. <laughs> so it reduced okay. the parameter space. Yes. Just okay, okay. That without Thanks. But, but but nobody expects sterile neutrinos then, right? I remember that. I mean, they reduce the allowed parameter space if you think that there is only one sterile. Just put two steriles, and then everything is open again. Let alone if you put three steriles. Is this clear? right? So, do sterile neutrinos make a contribution to n effective in cosmology if they are fully thermalized yes if not no okay okay thanks. so uh, there are ways to go away with that but remember that this is essentially anti-intuitive if you ruled out one two is still allowed and five is way more allowed because you have more parameters is this understood it's, it's completely counterintuitive right but probably just favored in as a... many as you want but not one but disfavored in the Bayesian sense, right? Yes. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So uh, why bother? <laughs> yes, I, I fully agree with that. Yeah. I fully agree with that. Yeah. Okay. So I was I, I forgot what I wear. So you take the difference between the appearance probability in the neutrino and the neutrino channel. Remember that you have to do appearance and not disappearance, because by the CPT disappearance is is forced to be exactly zero. The difference. Okay. So notice one thing. This the difference. Is proportional to all the mixing angles. This is why it was so essential to have this angle different from zero and as large as it could possibly be. If this angle were zero, this phase is unphysical. You can rephrase it away. If this angle is not zero but is miserably small, you are not going to see it anyway. Okay. Notice also that this is it's proportional to the three kinematic phases. Okay, these two are essentially identical. But the thing is, it goes like the sine and not as the sine squared. So if the kinematic phase is large, one of them, this average is to zero and not to a half as before. So this experiment is very sensitive to have the three kinematic phases sizable but not too sizable. And this sizable but not too sizable is a very narrow region because there is a factor of 50 between this mass difference and this mass difference. Okay, so this is a very delicate equilibrium, and you already know that this will need very long base time, several hundred to thousand kilometers. But several south hundred to thousand kilometers has one problem. Okay, we don't send neutrinos through pipes. Okay, you can imagine that thousand kilometers and just where pipe is different because the are not interacting. We send them through the earth, but the earth we haven't designed the earth. Okay, the earth is made of matter and not of antimatter. So the earth being made of matter and not of antimatter breaks the degeneracy between neutrinos and antineutrinos and induces a term, a fake CP violation term. It mimics because the air affects differently neutrinos and antineutrinos precisely because the interaction, it, that's two contributions. So now you have a double problem. You have to find out whether this phase is different from zero for this expression, the complete expression. You have to then induce from true genuine CP violation. How you are gonna do that? There are two, I would say complementary approaches. The first approach is the Japanese approach, which is okay, if you cannot deal with matter effects, keep them low. So go to short baseline, when short baseline means 200 kilometers. Okay, go to short baseline, but go, put your detector off axis. This sounds like really a crazy idea, and to some extent it is. Put your detector off axis seems re really, it's really radical, okay? It's put your detector point your beam somewhere and put your detector somewhere away from that 10 kilometers from that 
This sounds completely crazy because you are missing most of your statistics. Okay, however, it can be shown that the, the energy of your beam, the beam you're re reaching your off axis detector gets reduced. You have almost a monochromatic beam because the energy becomes very narrow and the energy lowers down a lot. So you have a monochromatic beam of low energy neutrinos. And for this particular window of low energy neutrinos, you have way more statistics than the one you have in the original beam. So this is what the Japanese are gonna do. What are the Americans gonna do together with the European? It's just the opposite approach. If you cannot beat matter effects, embrace them, okay? Embrace mm -hmm. them. So go as far as you can. So have as matter effects, as much matter effects as you possibly can. Go 1200 kilometers, but then go on axis. I mean, have a very broad band beam and tons of statistics. So by looking at the energy dependencies that in function of the spectrum, as the matter effects and the CP phase have different energy dependencies, you will be able to tell one thing from the other. So the idea is to do a simulation. And, and look at the spectral so you have to rely on a simulation. Yes. You always have. But you always have. But, uh, you always have. Yes, you always have. OK, they have two. Yeah, true. they have two. It's not that. So this is the plan. See, this is the plan. The plan is nice. The plan. I don't know how I'm doing, but you are okay. I can. I can. No, no, I'm doing fine. So this is the plan. No, I'm not fine. Uh, okay, but you so interrupt me a lot, so I'm gonna go a little bit more. How much is responsible? Yeah, just keep. Okay. So whenever you want, I stop. So this, I'm trying. I'm trying try to speed up a little bit. So this is the plan, what can go wrong? Many things can go wrong. You can have, for example, sterile neutrinos. If you have sterile neutrinos, if you have one additional sterile neutrino, the mu survival probability gets two additional terms, proportional to a new mass difference and two mixing numbers. So what would happen in this case? If this is a, a very difficult plot to read, let me walk you through that. This is the probability as a function of L over E, and the gray lines here are the sensitivities you will see in the near detector, in the far detector, as I said, these experiments have a near detector and the far detector. Above all, you have the neutrino energy going exactly the other way around, from right to left. Okay, so you don't look at all the lines. The black line is what you would observe if there were no strain neutrinos. The blue line is what you would get from the survival probability if there have one strain neutrino with this mass difference. So you see that you see nothing in the near detector, you have some sensitivity in the far detector. If you increase the mass difference a little bit more, you start gaining sensitivity on the near detector. And if you increase the mass difference even more, you get a lot of sensitivity in the near detector. So if you put everything together, okay, sorry. This is the mass difference and the mixing angles. Okay. The, Gray line is what you expect to measure in the far detector. The black line is what you expect to measure in the near detector. Okay, so you see everything is near detector because the red line is what is already excluded by the Raya Bay experiment. Here you have what I was asked before. So gray line is near is far detector, black line is near detector. Green is what is excluded by Minigun, and here, there, the different creatures are what is excluded by Saigun, by Microgun, by Minigun, okay? So this is what is excluded, here it survives. So there are regions in the parameter space where you can explain that. But- Sorry, where, where is that, the allowed region? The, combining everything together. This is all allowed. So this is all allowed, and you will never go low. So you will just go low. Okay. So there is always, and, and, and the day the day you rule out this, you can enlarge the same curve. And there is no combination, statistical combination of different. You just superimpose the different. Yes, yes. So let me go super fast about that. This is a distillate neutrino. is heavy, but not that heavy. What would happen if your distillate neutrino is heavier than? couple of tens of electron volts. This means that phase space is closed. You cannot produce this channel. But imagine you have one cell neutrino heavy, so this cannot be directly produced. Then your four times four mixing matrix will be the metallic, but your three times three block won't. 
And you are looking, since violations of unitarity will also have a problem in particular experiments. I'm not going to walk through that because it's, but you have violations of unitarity which can compromise your detector a lot. I'm not going to gonna enter into the test because otherwise I'm not going to cover anything. I still have 20 transparencies, but I won't go on and cover them. So don't worry. So, you, okay, I'm going to skip all this. Okay, don't worry. I'm not going to talk about that. There you are. So I'm not going to go on non-standard neutral interactions, but you can also have non-standard neutral interactions incorporated in Lagrangian. I'd rather talk about CPT Lagrangian. If I have to choose some topic, I'm going to choose some of this if, if we don't have time. Why we don't talk about CPT violation? We don't talk about CPT violation because we are taught in elementary school that any local relativistic quantum field theory that respects the invariance automatically has CPT built in. So CPT is a sacred cow. This is why nobody ever messes out with CPT violation. So even if you dream about CPT violation, which you may, if you consider neutrinos and antineutrinos may have different masses and different spectra, then someone who, who loves you and thinks he is doing good for you will give you this bound, which is the PDG bound on CPT violation in the concept, and which is the most stringent bound today, relative bound. And they say, with this bound, there is nothing you can do in neutrino physics. This bound I'm going to show you is extremely misleading. In physics, we love dimensionless bounds. We love dimensionless bounds because they convey a message. They say you how strong this bound is. Look at you. You are not looking fresh. 10 to the minus 18. Come on. But if CPT is violated in nature, the scale at which it's violated, it has nothing to do with the current mass. You could have gotten a much stronger bound, equally meaningless, if you have, could have put the flat mass there. Okay, look, I could have gotten a, a bound which is 19 orders of magnitude stronger by changing this scale by a plank. If instead of saying that, I could have put my mass, which is 10 to the 9 m planks, it could be even stronger, equally meaningless. Unless we have a knowledge which scale is associated with CPT violation, we cannot put a dimensionless bound because we don't know the scale of the phenomena. Besides that, the count is not an elementary particle. And its mass, we already know, it's not given by its constituents. It's given by QCD. So if this bound is testing something, this something has nothing to do with CPT violation of elementary particles. So if you have no idea, you have to restore the units of this bound. If you restore the units of this bound, you multiply both sides by the average mass of the count squared, and the bound you get gets this form. And this form not only looks way more like neutrinos, but it also looks in the right way because the count is a boson. And the parameter entered into the Lagrangian, whenever you talk about boson, is the mass squared and not the mass. So once you put the bound in this way, the bound does not look radical any longer. In fact, looks like a very lousy bound. Neutrino physics can already, uh, I haven't put that reference. We have already shown that this bound can be improved by five, six orders of magnitude. Already these are data, the paper we came out in 18, in 2018. So neutrinos are the best tool you can use to test CPT violation. On top of that, if the neutrino mass mechanism is related to a very high scale, it can have some information of a scales where we expect physics to be non-local. So there are reasons we you expect you think testing this with neutrino makes a lot of sense. I don't have time, but there is a lot to be said about solar neutrinos. I don't have time to say that. And let me okay, I I haven't said that. Let me, I'm skipping a lot of transparencies. Okay, so there I go. So I can also talk about violation of Lorentz invariance. Violation of Lorentz invariance are not as sacred as CPT, but this is the way like this. So it can be incorporated into the effect in Hamiltonian in the same way we have been before, where the first term is the Lorentz covariant term. 
This is the standard Lorentz covariance. This term, you may think of it like, like a vector acquiring a ref. This A is a dimension full parameter. And this term violates both CPT and Lorentz invariant. This term is like a tensor acquiring a ref, and it violates only Lorentz invariant. And as a rule of thumb, if you keep adding Lorentz indices, if you have an odd number of Lorentz indices, you violate both CPT and Lorentz invariants. If you have an even number of Lorentz indices, you violate only Lorentz invariants. Can I say something? Yes, of course. So, uh, so when you consider the CPT violation, so you are considering neutrino as a, as a Dirac particle. No, it can be Dirac or Majoran. It's irrelevant yeah. so, because so, the important thing is a master. Yeah. And the master has zero Lorentz indices. This is why CPT violation, the master is a different, is a different thing. No, but it's true that you can have CPT violation in the master, both with Majorana and Virat. It's a different thing how you incorporate both, but you can have, but CPT violation in the mass, like I want, the one I showed you before, cannot be put it into these languages because the master has zero Lorentz indices. So here there is no CPT violation in the master. Yeah, there is no, no. The CPT violation comes from like a, like a vector acquiring a VEF, like, like a, in the same class as you have when a scalar field rolls down to equilibrium, that phi dot is different from zero, the VEF, and you have locally CPT violation is the same. So you think your life is gonna be complicated, but it is not. Nature is very generous. And of course, the kinematic phase will always go like the difference in the eigenvalues of the effective Hamiltonian. So you already know how this is gonna go. You don't need me to be here. So this term has the standard L over E dependence we have seen before. This term has an additional energy on the numerator on top of the energy in the denominator. So you already know this term will have no energy dependence. This term has two energy dependencies in the numerator on top of that in the denominator. So this term will scale like the energy. So you see, it will be very easy to tell one number from the other one independent from the other because the spectral distortions are gigantic, I would say. So if you go to the neon neutrino survival probability, this is for a sequential of the energy, this, the standard term. This is what we measure, what we expect from the neon neutrino survival probability. This is the kind of spectral distortion this term is given me. And where I produce this curve with this, this is, remember that this has dimension, this is dimension two parameter, 10 to the minus 24 GBs. I produce this with 10 to the minus 24 GBs for the setup consistent with use. If I include only this term, these are the spectral distortion this term gives me when I produce this with 10 to the minus 22. This term is dimensionless. So you can imagine we are going to bound. This is the two together. This is the next generation of experiments. You will bound this alone. And you may ask, why should I care of bounding things beyond 10 to the minus 27, 10 to the minus 28? Is there any? And I would say that this is, we are just scratching the surface where we expect these terms to be, because we expect these terms, this knowledge violating terms, to be inversely proportional to M plus. We don't expect them to be order one, okay? Otherwise, we wouldn't have built local quantum relativistic theories, okay? Field theories. Uh, what is the theoretical motivation? Uh, Non-local theories, if you have if gravity is non-local, in the low energy, the integrated, the effective theory will have non-localities, which can be parameterized in this way, the, the, the extrapolated energy. So this, this, is related to non-local and to non-local effects, or some can maybe related to extra dimensions and things like that you are missing. So there is a lot of kind of physics that in 4D can mimic that. There is a, I mean, it depends on, there are other models for that. Well, I don't have time to cover, I skip a lot of mm -hmm. things. In fact, the, these are many, many other things the long baseline program will do. So let me conclude, I'm not that late, you know? Kind of. Okay, so the long baseline neutrino program, which will happen in Japan and in the US, has a bright future ahead. So they are going to do a lot of things, mostly precision experiments. 
So they will try to target. So the, the holy grail of experimentalists is precision on the oscillating parameters to get a hierarchy, to get in five, in five years, seven years, excuse me, the CP phase delta and to get the, the optal. However, if you are a theorist and you couldn't care less about the detector, you know that beyond the standard model physics can completely compromise this program. But it can make it program way, way more interesting than it is. Okay, thank you. Okay, you would like to thank speaker. Are there any questions or comments? I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes, 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 thank you. Hi, a, a few days ago, so I, a few days ago, there was a paper about doing long, long baseline neutrino research with the European spallation source. So I don't know anything about this at all. I just wanted to know what you think about that. Okay, what I mean, if, if it's, I mean, what I think it is. So it's a different regime, but I think it's, I mean, there were people, especially people from the US entertaining this idea. I think it's a fantastic idea because the expansion source is a great source of neutrinos with the different energies to the ones we have. And this is because we are bounded to neutrinos from accelerator. And this means that the energy ranges of these neutrinos is set because they are made with protons. So this is, I mean, this is what we have. If we have any other way of getting neutrinos of different energies is beyond reactors and beyond accelerators I mean, with different energies, this would be a fantastic idea. We are, to some extent, locked in the experiments we can do, but I think it's a fantastic idea. On the other hand, I do think there is something going on in related to the anomalies and things like that, and we need to sort this out. And any, I mean, I, I have said this before, you should measure whatever you can, okay? I wouldn't discriminate anything. I think it has some value. And on the other hand, the long baseline program, contrary to all the other experiments we have done so far, will be one of each class and will be no other experiment against to check the results. So complementary measures will be more than welcome. But this is my my, my bias, you know. Now, so experimentalists always complain to us that for a theorist, it's very easy to move from one experiment, one setup to the other. But for an experimentalist, it's a lifetime. <laughs> so probably I'm not the right person to say. Because, no, no, this is what, you know, people will say, okay, you analyzed it today, today, and tomorrow's June, and in, in three days, the spallation source. And probably this is true. But if I were an experimentalist, probably my take will be orthogonal to the one I'm taking. But, uh, different experiments will have different systematics, different, so different people. So it, it's always better to have. I think so. You have to, to, to be very careful because it takes a lot of time to measure these experiments. To calculate, I mean, for the spallation source in particular, mm -hmm. there are cross sections, production cross sections. We are not yet calculated, if I'm not mistaken. And mm -hmm. so, some of these cross sections were measured by Minerva, but some of them were not. So, in, in order to to take this experiment, some cross sections should mm -hmm. be studied first. Okay. In order, at least, to understand your being better, to see mm -hmm. what you are doing. What I would do, I would be happy to do any. Neutrino experiments. We are not at the position in the field as in general to dismiss any experiment. So, sorry, Gabriele, can you tell us what are the arguments from particle physics going into normal ordering? Um, because cosmologists seem to be getting there too, but obviously they have a huge problem that there's a 10% discrepancy in the Hubble parameter. Okay, no, you are saying how we, we say normal ordering, inverted ordering, this is what you are yeah, asking. Yeah, right, so, no, so I think I cosmologists think, are no, leading to the I, same thing, right? No, but, but I, I think cosmologists are, I mean, I have done cosmology now too. So the, there is a paper claiming that cosmology has found normal ordering over inverted ordering. It, it, Olga Menes in Valencia, isn't she? Yes, but Olga Menes in, in the anti-paper. 
The paper is Michia Verde, Raúl Jiménez, and Carlos Peñaray, Carlos Isto Valencia. And the anti-paper contains Katie Fries, Olga Mena, Mariam Tortola. Yes, 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 yes. So this is the debate. You know, it, it was it, it, the day we discussed this paper in Valencia, it was a very funny day. But I mean, <laughs> the thing is, cosmology, you are doing MCMCs. So Monte Carlo Markov chains and the priors are essentially shouldn't be important. Let me put it this way. If your result depends on a prior, this means your data is not informative enough. Okay. Right. So, oh, sorry, the, you need some prior. So in the sense prior, that you prior, have to improve a previous knowledge. If you have zero knowledge, you cannot improve previous knowledge. Okay, but if if you put two different priors and you get two different results, this means your data are not informative enough and you just cannot say anything. The, the ideal thing would be your results is in the, are independent of your prior. This is how it works. Bayesian analysis this is how it works. Yes. So all the paper he's referring to is Olga Mena, Marianne Tortola, Katie Fries, and I think also Martina Garmino, something. It's a brave, brave claim, right? Yes. But so, uh, so it, so what, what surprises me is basically cosmologists don't really understand background cosmology anymore because they've got a 10% description. No, <laughs> the 10% the think... problem with H0, right? So. I think what Olga said that this paper is they show that with five different priors, you get five different results. So the conclusion is you cannot claim anything because data right. are not informative enough. So that, that seems reasonable. That seems reasonable. So the, the claim, this paper, the paper, if the, if the paper you are saying is the paper I'm referring to, it's, yes, a yes, it honest, is. it's a very honest claim. They have five different priors, which I call A, B, C, D. One of them, this prior reproduces the Lichia Verde claim of normal ordering. But this paper shows that even before including data, you have already a one and a half sigma preference from normal ordering, just from priors. This shouldn't be the case, ever. Of course. Right. This would make, so, uh, depends where your priors are coming from. Okay, no, but the claim of Lichia, I mean, Lichia uh, is, not, is not a silly person. Come on, it's Lichia Verde. Okay, and so Lichia's claim is that it's true that it's a prior which is biased, but she says it's a physical prior. I, I, I'm not sure I buy this. So the, the claim there is not that the prior is not shaping the output. The, the, the claim there is that this prior is physical sound. It's physically sound. So I think this is the claim. These people are not silly people. They know what they are doing and they know that they are conditioning the results. So that the, the input conditions the output. I mean. But the claim they have is that there is a that the prior is physically sound. It's, but I don't I don't buy that. This is the part I don't buy. I mean, what physically sound means is just common sense, which is you know it changes with time. They are, I mean, I don't know. Okay, so so sense. long story short, then you're not going to buy anything from cosmology. Is that it? No, 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 no. no, no. <laughs> Particle <laughs> physicists don't believe cosmologists. <laughs> no, so no, no. I have done cosmology myself. So what I would say is that I we do should... cosmology, but but what I'm saying is that you have to to be very careful with the conclusion you extract. Cosmology is a very delicate matter, and the, I mean this is why in every cosmology paper you see, and I think this is the fair thing. Look, my advice. Look at the triangular plots. The triangular plots are not the conclusion plots. They are hidden somewhere in the paper. Do you know what I mean with the triangular plots? This is the papers, the MCMC, which shows- The corner plots, yeah, the that corner they, plots. Right? They, these plots show prior versus posterior. Mm -hmm. And then you can see where if, what you are you getting in and getting out. So by looking at, I decide whether to buy a paper or not, looking at these plots. So, because there is, I mean, you know, in, in computer science, they say they say always garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> and so I think this is exactly the same. Look at the triangular plots and see what so, you have put in so and what you have put in. It's okay that it's true that if you change the prior, if you have a lot of information, eventually you have uh, you converge to the yes. same, but you have you need enough information. If, if the problem is that if your prior knowledge is very low. Uh, basically, you have you start from a very non-informative situation, and in in bias, bias theory is a multi multiplicative one. 
if I multiply, multiply zero times anything, I get zero. So you have to you have to start. For instance, people uh, have been doing uh, Markov chain for supersymmetry, and they put they put priors for the the soft breaking parameters. This is nonsense. Okay, no, I wouldn't agree with you. What I'm saying is that if you don't have any knowledge, don't use a linear priors. Yeah, use a linear that, prior in yeah, the that, But in why, why a linear prior should be better than a prior on the squares or the, on, on no, the logarithm? Then, no, what I'm saying is that it, it was shown a couple of years ago, it was right. the same dividing cost yeah, So what I'm sense. saying is that if you are trying to explore, I mean, the, the ideal thing would be a flat prior. A flat prior will be there. However, if you are going to a, a no, the ideal thing is that you have a measurement that measures something, and then you make another measurement and you improve your knowledge of that something. But if you start from no knowledge, but we have only one universe. We yeah, I know, I know, but that's why that's why it's a it's a problem. Always using Bayes Bayesian approach, you 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 start from an ideal situation where you should measure the top mass, and then you do another measurement of the top mass. You add additional information. You increase. You add more information on some previous one. This is the All way right. Bayesian, Bayesian theorem should be applied. But instead, people have some three parameters. They had that. What, what you what you call a prior is not really a prior because a prior means a prior knowledge. But you have no idea where the parameter is. So in a sense, you you have to interpret this data with a grain of salt because this is not the real Bayesian theory. Bayes theory. No, I, I, what I would say is that I, I buy a lot of things. Obtaining cosmology, and normally people are not very aggressive with their statements. I mean, the problem with this paper is not the analysis, but the claim. What I would say is that it's not the analysis, but the claim they made out of it. So, if you remember, probably you do, those who are, who are miserably young, you know, but a couple of years ago, I would say before the pandemic, I don't know when, the opera ex experiment. Mm -hmm found some neutrinos, which were in theory faster than light. Right. Oh, okay. There was a loose scale at the end. Yes, but, loose scale. But, but if you look at the paper, the opera papers, the opera paper is rather modest and claiming physics, but the headlines everywhere in the world was Einstein was wrong. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> so what I think is that you have to be very careful. I mean, what you extract from data, you extract, Final point. Oh. If you are honest enough, it's fine with me. I mean, if we are I, I think Minos, Gabriela, I think Minos had a similar result, but nobody picked up on that, right? No, so there I must have been a press release issue to do with uh, opera, right? No, I think it's the other way around. We are reading this wrong. I was at Fermi at that time. Minos was about, it's, it's super sad, the story, because at that time, mm -hmm. Pierre Donnet was the director of the lab. And put a lot of money to get Minos confirm or rule out the result. And when Minos was about to rule out the result, Opera took it back. It took six months to Minos to recheck and not do the analysis. And this is the story I was told. By okay, okay. I, I thought Minos. they had some paper in that direction, right? Um, so and, but they didn't make a big song and dance, and the significance was less. It was maybe less than two sigma. But this is, a, I agree with you completely that this is. A, a, how much fuss you do about your paper. Remember that I when I sun made anti-hydrogen for the first time, it made the headlines everywhere in the world. And in Fermina we are really pissed off because they have made it long ago and just didn't make any fuss. So I think it's, it's again, it's the claim you do with your numbers instead of your numbers. And then this is how it's working now. But what I would say is that I find I have this discussion only today. I do trust cosmology. I do trust and I do extract information from cosmology. Well, I don't trust cosmology at all. And I can give you lots of reasons why you shouldn't trust <laughs> cosmology. But I'm not there. So it, it, this would have to happen over coffee or something like that. Um, <laughs> yeah okay let me ask you a separate question we just divert and um, so what in the best case scenario what are you going to get out in terms of new physics in these long baseline experiments so in the ideal scenario what discoveries do you think experimentalists would like to see okay if okay. things go their way okay no experimentalists are okay do you have experimentalists out there at home okay. hopefully not experimentalists are terribly blind people no <laughs> No, each time, you know, I met you, okay, I met you in collaboration member. And each time I bring about CPT violation or latency violence and things, 
they they freaked out because they really want to, to measure only CP by CP violation. And each time I say it would be way more interesting to find CPT violation. Come on. When you say that new physics would spoil the, 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 the party, what, what do you mean exactly? I, what I mean is that I mean if you look, let me show you something. Okay, this is minus and this is T2K, the last one. Okay, so you see here, these are neutrino parameters, these are antineutrino parameters. These are neutrino. So the joint analysis puts you there. You shouldn't do this in, in, in a lifetime. Okay, so instead, these people will miss any CPT violating signal because they average it out. <laughs> they average it out. I mean, and I, what I said in, in, in mathematics, you know, if you have this, let me show you. Okay, let me show you. This is gonna be easy. If you have a function, let's say, okay, these are neutrinos, these are anti neutrinos. This is the chi square. So, of course. For me, this is the minimum. For them, they will find the minimum, which is neither. So you shouldn't do the analysis. That's the like average that. that they take. Exactly. They will find the minimum that. This is not necessarily this equal to zero, this is equal to zero. Mm -hmm. This is what's happening to these people. But you know, you know, these people keep doing that. I mean, minus is the same. You see, this is the anti-neutrino best fit point. This is the neutrino best fit point, and this is the joint analysis because of cross sections, you have three times more neutrinos and neutrinos. So instead of seeing this may or may not be identical, these people mix this up because they are, you understand, they, they look statistics. I, am, I am fully agree with looking statistics, but. Well, you should do two separate analysis. One analysis, analysis is based on standard model and it another. Took us, it took us years to convince these people to present these results separately in neutrinos and neutrinos. We have been advocating for this for more than 10 years. And they have just recently done the separate analysis. But what I'm saying is that experimentalists will, I mean, no matter what, they will extract the CP by lighting phase delta. And they, they won't split the analysis like survival probability, extracting the survival probability, some parameters, and extracting the appearance probability, a different set of parameters. Look whether they are internally consistent to see whether it's violation of unitarity, serial neutrinos, or whatever. And after that, do that. Look now, you know that the T2K experiment is claiming they have already discovered CP, they have ruled out CP conservation to some level. Okay, they haven't tested CPT first. So I can address the result by slightly changing these two numbers, taking central values. And I reproduce the result with a phase zero. And I can claim they are finding CPT and not CP violation. So you shouldn't do that. You should test first whether your data are consistent. But yes, but CP violation is already present in standard model. CPT violation is more far-fetched let's say so why ah you said that we learned that in high, uh, elementary okay. school but you know we like it if this is physics we are used to make to turn sacred cows into hamburgers this is what we do for a living come on anyway so i think the, the my my favorite pictures would be to find something dramatic i mean to to really have the standard model die a very dramatic thing, CPT violation, violations of Lorentz invariance, no standard neutrino interaction, violation of unitarity, something like that. This is my favorite picture. I mean, the second favorite picture would be a serenity. So, um, so, is, so, so is there any experiment that is that will test the neutrino Dirac and Majorana accept this neutrino less double beta decay? Yes. Uh, I mean, neutrino less double beta decay, all of them, the ship experiment at CERN, mm -hmm. if you have a low scale Majorana, the ship experiment will, will produce them. There are some people, Tao Han, Silvia Pasquale, I don't know who else, 
they have shown that also you can have Majorana, not Majorana signal, but Majorana neutrino as a low energy Majorana neutrino as intermediate state in the collider. And then you have electron number violating processes in the collider. This is very far fetched though. But you can have that. Yes, you can. And I think for me, again, as I said, Iraq versus Majorana is the question. All the rest is. is so, so, if, so if, if, you, if you do not see any any signal for neutrino less double with any. This does not then, mean neutrino is Iraq. No, this does not mean neutrino is Iraq. It may happen that a neutrino can be a major particle. Remember that neutrino less double beta decay measure an effective mass. Yes. Measure an effective mass and not a mass. And an effective mass means the contribution of the three masses plus phases. This means that you have two additional phases and a phase can change the sign of a term and therefore you can have cancellations. The truth is that given that if you look at the at the effective mass in detail, in if the order in this inverted, you cannot have cancellations. If the order is normal, you can have cancellations. And this means that the effective mass can be zero or zero to the level you can test. You can make it very, very small and still be majorana. So nature can be mean and we can miss neutrino less double beta decay and still and neutrino be majorana. You somewhat tune the parameters. Yes, the two phases. The two phases, you, you, so you might probably have to explain why they are, they are so. But you will never find out. Yeah, yeah, you never find out. You will know no, because. I know, I know, yeah. you, you will know because for you, you will have a negative Search for natural beta decay. So you mentioned an experimental alternative to the beta decay. Can you tell us a little bit more that, that we, What did I say? Sheep? Yeah, see exactly Sheep how is, the what is the strategy? Sheep stands for search for hidden particles. It's a small experiment that CERN, which is meant to measure among other things, if Majoranas are of the order of 100 TVs, 2000 TVs, or a little bit higher than that, and any neutral particles, maybe also charged particles to some extent in this range. This is a this is a strange thing. This is a, as in terminal state. Yes. And this is also for some dark matter candidates can play a role there. So it's it's an experiment that is it's I think it was given green light not that long ago. So it's mm. happening. Yeah. But again, it's a very narrow range of yeah. Majoranas. And now, after she got approved, or at least got reunited first, there are a lot of models whose scale is 100 to 1,000 TVs. But I think this is not the natural scale. The natural scale will be more 10 to the 14, 10 to the 15 TVs. But you will, whatever you can. Mm -hmm. okay. Uh, you mentioned that these uh, long baseline experiments uh, can have some uh, knowledge about this dark matter physics. Right? Yes, uh, no, yes, sorry. Uh, this, uh, this is Dune. Dune will have a near detector and a far detector, and there are things you can do. And th there were a lot of discussions about dark matter and enlarging the near detector hole to accommodate dark matter searches there in this detector. But this is the physics. If you are really interested, there is a, you should join the near detector physics group in the new collaboration. I think this is pretty much open. I'm not sure. And yes, there will be dark matter searches. It's because of the volume. Although I call it a near detector and I say it's small, these are <laughs> building side detector. It's just that the Five detector is enormous. This is why you call it a small so, detector. Sorry, I put kind of interaction, but I would kind of so you, you search the matter. Uh, so it's it's uh, a detector. Yes, yes, yes. But, so this this is not an underground detector. So you have yeah you have a huge amount of background. Is this true? Usually all yeah. all, all the detection experiments but are I underground. Think so you have background the problems. But but the directionality will help, won't it? 
because uh, direct, you have directionality. You have directionality here because and this directionality should help. Mm. Okay, it's true that it's not underground, but you have directionality and this should help. So probably it depends on the cross section. Okay. So some I mean it's not meant for that, but mm -hmm. some it's all the same with proton decay. It's not meant for that. But with these volumes, you know, at the end of the day, you have the volume. If you have the volume, there is something you can do. There is more interesting than that is a diffuse supernova background. This 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 will do to a very good extent diffuse supernova background. I, I I think to this is they will do very competitive physics there. No, no, they they can do a lot of things. You know, you have thousand people thinking what to do with their detector. And what about the Majorana phases? Is it possible to measure those Majorana phases? These are other two phases. Yes. So, any experiment is designed to search for this Majorana phase? No, phases? wait, no. Look at this. Okay. So, they always enter in the same combination. So, you won't tell one from the other because whatever enters in any experiment, where the neutrino is supposed to show its Majorana character mm. is defecting mass. So it's the same combination of the two phases. Mm. So you won't be, I, I doubt you will be able to tell this combination, but I don't think we are there yet. I mean, we would give whatever we don't have in order to measure a signal, no matter which signal. So I don't think, and once you try to extract information from the signal, you need the absolute mass scale of the neutrino, something we don't have. So you need, you have two phases and the absolute mass scale all combined into one parameter. No chance, no chance. Okay, not at least before I read that. Any other question? Yeah, Gabriela, just a quick one. Uh, it's a bit off topic. Uh, Korea seems to have green lighted a Korea neutrino observatory. Um, can you comment on the science they're going to do? I mean, maybe this somebody can correct me if it hasn't been green lighted. The Korean <laughs> observatory, which will be, is what are you going to do? I think they were looking at the next oscillation. So, you know, signal starts in J Park, goes through Nagano. Ah, I know what you mean. I didn't know it was called the European. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm sure. Right. So, did they, I think this has been funded. It's been green lighted, or maybe they're still campaigning for the money. Um, but yeah, these would be secondary oscillations or maybe tertiary ones. Okay. I don't know what's there. Hopefully, you're not seeing these. Are you? Okay. I hope you're yeah, not seeing my kids. But anyway, if you do, I, do you have a slide on this? We are seeing it on the screen, but not on Zoom. Okay, so fantastic. Uh, I think the, what you are going to do is if J Park, you are going to, I mean, it depends. Okay, let me be. You, if this is what I think it is, you are going to get more matter effects than D2K. So you right. So, so these are if you have way more matter effects, then probably you will have a say about the ordering. But then you have to to think whether you want to come too late. I I don't know. Normally you expect you to be delayed, but and okay. If the phase is different from zero, you can do. I mean, if you find anything, anything not the standard picture then it will be fantastic to do that but in any case you will do i mean if you have this detector there you can do supernova physics and dark matter and proton decay and i think it's going to be much smaller than cameo candy though so it's like a hyper k right so yeah maybe you know it may not be big enough to do these things right you don't need to be competitive with with like it's sort of like a secondary detector, right? But if you have two detectors, right? If you use the the, the two baselines, you can mm -hmm. do a lot of physics because you have two baselines. So there are things you can do that you can, for example. 
right. you are benefiting from two different baseline and the same energy. So there is a, and you have the near detector on top of that. So mm -hmm. there is a lot of physics you can do related to oscillations, but it's related to the octant and precision. And right. there are some things. Right. No, and I think, I mean, my experience, at least yeah, my experience from Argentina with the OJ experiment, okay, is that it, it doesn't matter whether, I mean, it brings a lot of young people to the field, and this is good for all of us. Having an experiment at home, it's good because it brings a lot of people to all, to all the field and it keeps the fields healthy and this is always good. Right, that's a, yeah, that's true, that's true, that's true. Okay, thanks very much for the comment. You're welcome, bye. Okay, thanks again. Okay, if there is no more question, let's thank the speaker again and finish the formal part.